Okay, broadcast is live. Now, screen share. Okay, we are up and live right now. Um, which, uh, which was it? If I didn't respond to it, perhaps not. Um, it was called the story of Darian Feller. Oh yes, okay. that's that's been graded, and you should have received a message oh. with your grade and everything. Okay. No, I haven't. Email in a bit. Um, is it alright? I write other things in my worlds. I I beg your pardon. I'm trying. Is it all right if I write other things in worlds that I've created like that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. This, this, this is just fine. At this point in the class, there are no restrictions as to content. I want you all to be creative in whatever directions appeal to you. Later on, as we see the need, and some of you have seen uh, indications and suggestions uh, for further writing, uh, I'm going to suggest doing things that are perhaps a little bit more challenging than the ones that you've undertaken because you need to stretch yourselves a little bit. For, but for right now, I'm, I'm getting a concept of where everybody stands. Some of you have received uh, messages saying, see if you can uh, try something else, try something uh, argumentative, perhaps try something explanatory or informational. You see what I mean? There are a number of different directions you can take. Okay, we are up and going, and we are officially online. And as far as I can tell, this feed is working. Uh, uh, Micah, can we tell whether this feed is working? Okay, and I don't know if we can tell whether Diana is online, but in any case, she'll be able to listen to it. Um, this is our. <laughs> this isn't our first. Last week sort of worked, but this is our first effort to do this as a live hangout on air using Google Plus which will allow us then to uh, store it on YouTube and have it available in the future. There is no camera, so you folks are not in any picture. What uh, uh, people online are seeing is what you're seeing here on screen. And so uh, I'm hoping that that screen refresh is going to be fast enough to keep up with, with what we're doing in here. And I hear my voice coming out of uh, Micah's device over there, so presumably we are up and functional. And we have so much to go through today, and thank you all for all of the wonderful material that you have submitted. And as usual, uh, some people due to conflicts are not, have not yet arrived, and we will work without them. Okay, before we go any further, are there any specific questions? Okay. I actually had a question. Yes, by all means. Um, if I find those um, poems by Tolkien online somewhere, mm -hmm. where should I post the links to them on the website? Um, that's a good point. If you'd like to, you can just do it in the poetry forum, if you'd like. We have a forum for uh, the writer's forum. We also have an open forum for anything. We have a poetry forum. It's further down in the classroom under the heading poetry. Okay. And so that, that would be a fine place to do it. The only problem with that is not everyone will be subscribed to that forum. The only one you're automatically subscribed to is the assignments forum. And so not everyone will necessarily see that it's there. Um, let's just, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on it and, uh, and look for that sort of thing. Um, Yes, all of Tolkien, of course, is available online. It's not necessarily legally available online, but it's out there in so many places that it's, it's hard, to, uh, hard to ignore, and it's much easier to use it that way. We each have our book in front of us. It's not as though we are pirating anything. Uh, let's just sort of pretend the book in front of us is somehow magically being projected onto the screen if and when we need to do that. Technically, it's just much easier to look at a Russian site that already has the, has the book or posted there. And there's a link uh, on our page to such a place. 
Um, if any of you are interested in finding material that's online, and you're always going to find it if it's as popular and well-known as Tolkien is, how do you go about doing that? It's pretty straightforward. If you look for the title itself, you may not find it. If you find a unique phrase and look for it, you will find it probably in many places, some of which are being presented a chapter at a time or even a page at a time. But if you take a phrase from the beginning of the book and a phrase from the end of the book, put them both in quotes and put pluses in front of each, you will find the entire book if in fact it's out there anywhere. And so whenever you're looking for something, that's, that's really the way to do it. And you'll find the entire text of an awful lot of things out there. Okay, um, let's go through. We have a, a, a wonderful collection of material that's been handed in and all kinds of other things that we have been requested. We have got the high priority assignments, the secondary priority assignments, and the tertiary priority assignments. And I'm not sure any of you folks have got to the secondary or tertiary ones. I think, as far as I can tell, the only person who read all of them is Diane, who's the person who's not here. Hi. Did you? Wonderful, wonderful. So you, you got to the poems at the end there. The, aren't those interesting? Okay, and we may uh, visit those at some point. I, I thought that those, uh, let's, let's, let's start with those actually. Uh, Okay, <laughs> they're, they're down here under tertiary assignments. Here they are. Uh, why English is Difficult. Uh, there are a couple of poems there, and I think they're probably deserving of recitation. The longer one perhaps is not worth our class time to do, but there is an audio recording connected to it. Has it have you listened to that? I read it. You read it, but you didn't listen to the audio recording. Okay, now it, it, it goes on a while, and the audio recording has one error in it that I'm aware of, but it does go on forever, and I have yet to meet anybody who can get anywhere close to getting all of it pronounced correctly as we go through. Uh, let's, let's visit that one later on. Okay. Um, the uh, high priority assignments, uh, I wanted to add one here at the top for next week and subsequent weeks. Specifically, I'd like to work on oratory uh, in the sense that I would like to work on scripted speech, but trying to make it sound unscripted when presenting it. This is a skill. This is an important skill to acquire. In fact, if you're going to be giving speeches, you do not want them to sound as though they're being read and an awful lot of teachers, unfortunately, have never achieved that. And uh, it sounds as though it's being read ploddingly and not necessarily very well. Uh, so I, I think this is a, a, a worthwhile endeavor. I'm not, however, going to expect you to uh, write the script yourself, but I want it to be polished and eloquent. And there are so many examples of that in our classroom. You may choose what you'd like uh, to, to be sure of the eloquence necessary. You might consider looking at uh, uh, Dr. David Berlinski's addresses, uh, uh, Stephen Fry's addresses, and uh, uh, Eagleton is the one I assign to you. Everything he says is absolutely amazing, though you may not necessarily agree with the content. And here I have to, again, apologize and, uh, and present a little caveat. The, the one I assigned to you, I assigned it simply because it just appeared last week, as I said, just before, uh, before class I discovered it. And it's not necessarily material that's, that's going to be, that's going to receive overall uh, acceptance and appreciation, perhaps. How many people did listen to that? Okay. Which one? This is uh, Terry Eagleton's uh, lecture right here. 
That was under high priorities. Good, good, good. I, uh, if it was under the high priority, then I did listen to it. Good. Um, now, uh, as we're going to encounter this kind of thing throughout the class, and you're going to encounter it throughout life. You're going to see things that you don't necessarily agree with, but uh, we have to uh, look at uh, that kind of thing and exercise a certain amount of uh, uh, evaluation and scrutiny and uh, uh, exhibit uh, really some rational thought and uh, sort through material and critique it appropriately. Uh, what did everyone think of this particular uh, lecture? Does anybody have any thoughts on it at all? Was? Oh. No, go ahead. Okay. Is, is that the one called like the use of God or something like that? That's what he was talking about, that yeah. I, when I was paying attention to what he was saying specifically, thought he was kind of missing the, I'm not sure. He sounded like if you weren't paying all that much attention to what he said, was saying, then he was not understanding what he was talking about. He was missing the point of having a God mm -hmm. in theology. It was like he kept talking about, like, God not having any use to man, and I was thinking, well, maybe not, but that's irrelevant to the universe. So um, that, that's a very good point. In fact, it's one of the points I think he tried to make in a way is the irrelevance to the universe. Um, I chose this, of course, entirely because uh, Eagleton is such a remarkable character. He's, uh, you listen to the beginning of it where they gave his background. Uh, he, he's just one of the uh, the, the most remarkable writers in the world. Um, however, it was interesting at the end. One of the uh, one of the questions that was raised was, uh, or one of the speakers at least who uh, who purportedly asked a question made the remark that uh, th this is really of no value to us, is it? <laughs> but uh, but it's it's delicious to listen to. Does anybody have any other uh, th thoughts, particularly? on his, uh, his eloquence, uh, his way of presenting the material. Was it scripted, first of all? Didn't sound scripted. No, I couldn't tell. Yeah. You, you can't tell, but uh, in many occasion, on many occasions I've noticed that it was scripted, but that's only when he had difficulty turning a page or something. Uh, yet his delivery is just flawless. You can't tell. And then when he goes off script, which of course he must do in order to respond to questions, you can't tell there either because his unscripted speech is just as flawless as that which is written down in front of him. And so he, he's, he's a remarkable character. We have a number of other lectures of his in the classroom. Uh, he's done a number on... Uh, the event of literature is one of them, and uh, another one on evil specifically. There, yeah, the concept of evil, and he mentions that one in, indeed in this particular lecture. And so, any of those that uh, that you might like to look at and use for this project uh, would be fine, or anything else you feel like uh, uh, like choosing. Uh, I'd like something that is that uses language that's a little over your head, if you see my point. Something that uh, really uh, uses language as an art form. And uh, let's just take a short piece, maybe just a couple of paragraphs, because we don't have that much classroom time. But practice delivery and see if we can't deliver it as though it is coming directly from us. And so choose something that you like. And if you need more uh, suggestions, there are many in the classroom, and I'd be glad to uh, make some specific suggestions if you have any questions on those. Any thoughts on this? I, I thought Terry Eagleton was really funny, though. <laughs> yeah. he, he, is, he is funny. And in fact, he's been called by one of his academic colleagues a stand-up comedian, which in a sense he is. 
but oh, what a stand-up comedian! I mean, with the, the the language that's that's coming out is just just superb. Uh, and again, uh, we have to um, uh, implement critical thinking in everything that we read, everything that uh, comes down. Think about it seriously, and uh, uh, subject it to judgment, and uh, come up with your own conclusions about it. Okay, um, commonly confused verb pairs. I did assign this to everyone, and uh, I thought we could go over and look at that if anybody has any questions about them. Yes? Um, I think I just have two. Um, okay, so for the who slash whom, I didn't, oh no, actually, that one I think I got, but the lie slash lay one, I got confused with seven and eight. I mean, technically just eight, but it kind of... As, as I recall, actually, these are uh, these are really quite tricky. And now I've got to figure out where I put them. Okay, I guess the... Uh, no, it's not back there. It's Here are our poems, which we may get to if we feel like it. There is some other wonderful stuff that we will... Uh, Discuss. Did anybody look at the sorites, by the way? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. aren't those wonderful? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, scansion, yes. Here we are, lilac. And uh, the, uh, the questions themselves, I believe, are right here, are they not? Yes. Those seven and eight. Okay. Uh, seven and eight. I couldn't lie down where the peacock had laid yesterday, and I couldn't lie down where the peahen had laid yesterday. Are these the ones you had trouble with? Okay, yes. I, I did not trouble with seven, but then once I got to eight, I saw no difference at all. Okay. So. Yes. Did you did you read the answers are right below? Yes, I did. So that's why I was trying to, I think I got it, but I wasn't totally sure. If I did. So. Okay. Um, yeah. What What's really going on here is we've got line lay. And lies intransitive, it simply indicates a state. Today I lie, yesterday I lay, I have lain. And whereas transitive takes an object, uh, I lay it on, uh, on the table, I laid it on the table yesterday, I have laid it on the table, a chicken lays eggs. A peahen lays eggs, a peacock does not. And that's what the difference is between seven and eight. Do you see what I mean? It becomes possible if we're talking about a, a, a peahen, because a peahen is capable of laying eggs and doing that in a particular location. And so, in fact, this one is grammatical, even though it means something quite different. Okay. Okay. It's, it's, it was intended as intentionally tricky. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. But can't the peacock have laid something else down? Um, no, it could have laid something else down. But normally, when you use yes, the yes, word lay, I mean. transitive, without an object, it assumes an oviparous creature producing an egg. Okay. Yeah. The, the chickens are laying in the backyard. That's understandable, and it's transitive. It's just there's no object. There's no object needed because we know what chickens lay. Right? Okay. Okay. Any, anybody else have any trouble with these? Yes. Okay, can you turn up the volume just a little bit, and what is confusing? Um, no, I, I get it, but it's just confusing. Um, they are confusing, and in fact, uh, a large percentage of Americans tend to remain perpetually and uh, perhaps terminally confused by these. Uh, it's, um, it's not something that's generally understood that well, but uh, English majors do understand it, and when you're writing for a uh, uh, for a teacher who does understand it, you want to get them right. And so the lie and lay are, are perhaps the most common uh, problems, but the others exist as well. And I suddenly realized when I looked in here that all I, although I have uh, fall and fell and rise and raise, I forgot to put sit and set up above there too, and sit. And set is, is another one of those uh, those pairs. You set something on the table, and the, and the object sits on the table. Mm -hmm. It follows the it same. In the exercise. Yeah, no. 
I, th I think it's in the extract, but it's not in the explanation of football. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh well. Anyway, uh, hang, hang. That one's sort of awkward because it's uh, the wrong usage has gained acceptance and gone into the dictionary. But uh, the fall fell and the rise. Uh, do you understand these charts and how they how they work? Okay, very good. Okay, the who whom. These are tricky simply because. The who has taken over, and places where whom is appropriate are now being semi legitimately filled by who. Uh, I find it still difficult to say by who without saying by whom, because when it's the object of a preposition or indeed the object of a verb, it should be whom. The simple way to solve, uh, to understand which is correct is explained in here. Would somebody like to explain it to us? I think you just take the subject, verb, and the noun, I think. And then you put a he or him in it. Exactly. Wherever the who or whom is, put in he or him instead, because our ears understand he and him. You can't, uh, can't say, uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, unfortunately, we can use who in places in the sentence that we can't use him very comfortably. Who did you see yesterday? No, it's whom did you see yesterday? And you do that by switching things around and saying, did you see he or did you see him? And that's pretty straightforward. And once you figure out did you see him, him, then you know it's whom did you see. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes you have to rearrange the sentence so that you can put it in a form uh, that your ears will recognize and be able to evaluate appropriately. But if you make it into he and him, it solves the problem. Yes? Um, just a quick update. Uh, Elijah is in the classroom, the class chat room, and he's, I, he's asked where the link is, and I direct him to it. Very good. Thank you. Um, also, the question is whether we want to take a chance on the uh, uh, on the bandwidth being good enough to uh, initiate an a online conference so that he can speak. Do you want to try that? Well, it depends on whether he wanted to try it. He did promise us to give, a rend give us a rendition of The Man in the Moon this week, didn't he, from Tolkien's, uh, or there was an inn, a merry old inn, right? Anyway, we can look at that uh, and find out I, what I he called it. I could do a private hangout with him. You couldn't. I, I could. You could. Yeah. Um, do I you want to try could. that? Do, is that one going through yeah. the Wi-Fi, or is that going through your own system? It's going through the Wi-Fi. OK. Um, I'm just a little leery about overloading it, yeah. because we had trouble last week. But I think we're using the good one now, and that should be adequate. Yeah. OK. Let's go back to where we were. And we talked about high priority assignments, and everybody understands the lie lay and the who whom problem, right? Thoroughly? I'm, I'm working on the who whom. So. Okay, I, I have a more difficult who whom exercise a little further okay. down there, which is really very tricky, and it uses some other features of the English language that. Uh, that add to the complexity. And I'd be glad to go through that at some point, but if you understand it up to this point, that's our major priority for now. Okay, math. We've been asked to look at some mathematics. Well, this is a homeschool class. That means we don't have to stop uh, at the uh, borders of the English language, or in fact, language at all. We can go into other fields, as long as we do so in formal English, it's perfectly acceptable. Let's look at, uh, uh, we, we've got the syllogisms here, and uh, oh, I wish I could remember exactly where I put everything in these tabs. Okay, here we've got the poems, here we've got the uh, math, here we've got the sorites. Who's Lewis Carroll? Right, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, absolutely. And uh, he has a wonderful sense of humor. And I think one sees that even more outside of Alice in Wonderland than one does in the, in the story. Although, of course, there are some wonderful things in the story, yes. Who brought Willy Wonka? Uh, 
<laughs> Somebody help me with that. I can't remember oh, the... I know this, too. Uh, uh, isn't it like Ronald... Yeah, Dole. 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 <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay, Ronald Dahl? Dahl, yeah. Dole. Okay. D-A-A. Rolled Dahl, oh. isn't it? <gasps> Rolled Dahl. That's yeah. it, that's it, okay. Oh, oh, oh. I probably can't remember. Yeah. My favorite one is, oh, what is that one? The Mr. I don't know. I don't know. It's, I think it's find, find some and post it. Problem is, he's under copyright. Oh, yeah. well, aren't always people under copyright? Uh, the well, some of the, it varies, right? It, it, it depends on when it was written. In this country, copyright cuts off at uh, 1922. Uh, anything before uh, 1922 or earlier is, uh, is out of copyright. And so uh, when it comes to poems, however, you'll find that poems are excerpted all over the place. And so uh, I'm sure we can find it. But if you have specific ones that you'd like to share with us, post in the open forum or wherever. Okay. Um, did anybody go through through these, understand what, what was going on there? Uh, all right. Uh, would you mind... Uh, uh, let, let's let's look at number two. You know, we have my saucepans are the only thing I have that are made of tin. I find all your presents very useful. None of my saucepans are of the slightest use. What one wants to do there is draw the the furthest uh, ineluctable conclusion that one can based upon those three statements. And uh, there, there's a trick to doing it, of course. Uh, uh, my uh, saucepans are not of, uh, none of my saucepans are of the slightest use. This is the sort of connector because both saucepans and whether something is useful exist up above. And so what one needs to do is find the ends of the sorite and then string it together. And so. Uh, it's a, a made out of tin is one of them. So the, the saucepans are made out of tin. Saucepans are not of the slightest use. All of your presents are useful. What can we glean from that? The maximum that we can glean from that. None of your presents are made of tin. Yeah, nothing you've given me is made out of tin. Does that make sense? Okay, and he stretches these barriers wander among the signs of the zodiac. Nothing that does not wander among the signs of the zodiac is a comet. Nothing but a terrier has a curly tail. What can we do with that? I'm Nothing kind of... in the zodiac has a curly No comets have a curly tail? Got it, got it. No comets have a curly tail. You're absolutely right about the other one, but it wasn't the maximum conclusion you could draw. Okay, I just thought I'd show show these to you, and if you feel like coming in and looking at them further, by all means. But we won't uh, waste any more time with it. But uh, Lewis Carroll indeed uh, wrote a number of books on logic, uh, as well as uh, incorporating a number of logical principles into uh, his stories of Alice and Alice Through the Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland. Oh, wait, can we do? The next one, I'm which, kind of confused. Which one is that? Uh, I don't know. You... No one takes at the times. Yeah. No one uh, takes well, in the times. Let's scroll down a little bit more. Okay. Right there at the bottom. No. That's in the middle. No one takes in the times unless he is well educated. No hedgehogs can read. Those who cannot read are not well educated. It's it's about the middle. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So uh, no one takes in the times unless he is well educated. Okay, we can see that times exists only in, in this uh, series in only one place, so it's got to be at one end or the other. Okay, and so uh, we've got well educated is in two places and the, uh, it's connected down here, and those who cannot read are not well educated. No hedgehogs can read. No hedgehogs are well educated, therefore no hedgehogs, no hedgehogs take the times. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, yeah, I get that. Okay. The, the sorite is simply an extended syllogism. Uh, syllogism you've come across in logic, and there are various legitimate and various illegitimate syllogisms. Uh, uh, 
all Greeks can read, Aristotle is a Greek, therefore Aristotle can read, that sort of, that sort of thing. That's a syllogism. These just take it a little bit further and uh, are quite enjoyable. Uh, okay, uh, well, I think we're finished with these. Okay, let's look at the math. Um, we were uh, thinking about, um, I'm going to try focusing that a little bit, and perhaps uh, expanding it a little bit. Okay, determining for any date by mental calculation. Now, that sounds sort of difficult to do in a way, to say, okay, well, what, what was uh, July 13th, 1903? And uh, there are people who can do that with them in, in a matter of a second or two using an algorithm like this. There are some very odd idiot savants who have some sort of a natural ability to do that, although they're unable to dress themselves in the morning. It's a very, very odd condition. And uh, the, the, if you've seen the movie Rain Man, it's based on a specific example of that. It, uh, it's, it's, it's a very strange thought, but uh, it's not something you need to be an idiot in order to do. We can figure this one out fairly easily. Did you all read the, the process here? Did you all understand what was going on in this process? Well, I mean, I read it, but I... Okay, yeah. it is a little... Con um, basically, you need to calculate an offset number for the century, for the year itself, for the month, and for the day. And just add up all those numbers, uh, run it through modulo 7, cast out 7s, and the result is the number that corresponds to the day of the week. Now, how we arrive at each one of those uh, uh, is, is the process that is uh, described in here. Uh, it turns out that our century is a zero. So for all of this century, we have to think about the century number. In earlier centuries, we'll have to uh, find out what the century number is. The century number, it turns out, just goes through a rotation of four different numbers. We can look at that. Um, the, uh, so the, after you've figured out the century number, then we have to look at the last two digits of the, uh, of the year number and determine what that year number is going to be. That's fairly simple. It's take the number itself, in this case 13, and then add the number of fours in the number. How many fours are there in 13? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, that was really sad. Two, no, three. Three. Yes. I'm sorry, okay. that's so sad. Yeah. Like if 13 is one, three. Right. So, uh, right, we're not adding the digits in the number, we're saying how many fours there are in 13. <laughs> so so really there are sad. three, so that makes 16. And uh, that gives us uh, then the number itself. Uh, when we cast out sevens, what is 16? Divide by seven and throw away the remainder. Oh, I'm sorry. Divide by seven and keep the remainder and throw the rest away. What we just did with the fours was divide by four and throw away the remainder. Okay, so that that's uh, we want to do the other way around. Do uh, modulo seven. What is sixteen modulo seven? Two. Two. Got it. Okay. So our year number is two. That's nice and straightforward. The months. I'm afraid one has to memorize those, and it's not that hard to do. It's it's a a, a sequence. Uh, let's see. Oh, where there is my sequence here? Oh, it's explained further down. We we have to memorize those, and uh, uh, so what what I'd like to do here is. Uh, First of all, let's just practice something. Monday is a 1, Tuesday is a 2. So that's the way we're going to uh, define the days of the week. Uh, I'll give you a number and you tell me what day of the week it's going to be. Okay? 3. Wednesday. 0. Sunday. Right. Uh, 6. 
Saturday. Four. Thursday. Very good. Uh, Sixteen. Wednesday. No. Tuesday. 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 Very good. No, you, you, you were doing exactly the right thing. You just, you just missed it. Because, again, we can just uh, cast out sevens at any point and, and bring it down to something reasonable. So what is uh, 27, for example? I, I can see yeah, wheels not Saturday? turning. Yeah, Saturday. Yes, very good. It's a Saturday. And, in fact, you can... Uh, you can think about that the other way around. Instead of casting out sevens, you can say, okay, it's just one less than 28, so it's negative one, if you wanted to do that. You know, it's just oh, yeah. what, <laughs> one well, short. I just said seven, That's what I did. seven times, but I don't know what I did. I don't know what I well, you did it right. You did it right. It was fine. Okay, so we, we want to get that down a little bit. So let, let's let's just uh, try a little bit more. What's, what's a 12, for example? <laughs> Twelve. Oh, it's a Saturday. Well, and are we using zero or seven? No. no Friday is the was what I oh. was calculating. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Is Sunday zero or seven? Sunday is zero and seven, because a seven is a zero. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to think of it as a seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Sunday is a zero or seven. Uh, and so if I were to say what day is tw the 21, it's Sunday. What uh, day is 14? It's a Sunday. What day is 49? It's a Sunday. And then we have to simply calculate. Uh, really what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I've got my uh, 36. Let's uh, subtract the next lower power, uh, the next uh, lower uh uh, product of seven, which would end up being 35, so that would make it a Monday, right? Okay, now we've got that part figured out. Now what we have to do is throw in the others, yeah. What do we use this for? Like, what do you use it in? You know what I mean? Okay, well, um, what uh, what day is uh, Halloween going to fall on? 31st. It, always, it is on the 31st. Oh, I'm what sorry. day of the week is it going to fall on? Oh my gosh, I get this now. Okay. I'm like, why? Oh, that makes sense. It does. No, it does. Okay, I'm like, why are you doing this? Oh. You'll have a calendar in your head. You'll never have to look at it. <laughs> okay, let's just look at the other, other part. 13. 13, we discovered, is a 2. Because 13 plus 3 is 16, and 16 modulo 7 is 2. So uh, our year is a 2. The month numbers themselves, let's find that, that list here. Uh, here, this, here. Here it shows you how the century numbers were 1, 5, 3, uh, down to the beginning of the, uh, the Gregorian calendar, which, okay, here are the month numbers. And the way I, I remember these, people remember them in different ways, but I found it was easy enough just to look down to the list. Let's ignore leap years. And by the way, I, in the program I'm about to show you, I have ignored leap years uh, for no particular reason. I just didn't get around to it, but I can fix that for next time. So it's actually 622, uh, 503, 514, 624. It's not really hard to remember those, but it takes a little time to, uh, to put it together. What I would do is just, you know, put the chart in front of you and, and play around with it for a while. 622 is uh, nice and easy to specific number to remember. It's the crucial number of the Mozart clarinet concerto. It pops up <laughs> in various other, other things. Um, uh, the 503 is fairly easy, and once you get the 503, think about 514. Uh, hmm. And then the last one is almost the same as the first one. It's not 622, it's 624. And there's only one place in here where they have two, uh, two numbers of the same in, in a row. And that's February to March. And the reason for that, of course, is that, at least in non-leap years, February has an, uh, an even multiple of seven 
days in it. And so, of course, it doesn't change from that one month to the next one because it has 28 days. Uh, okay, so that's the, uh, the month number. The month number for uh, October, as you can see, is a six. The month number for, uh, I'm sorry, the year number is a two. So what is uh, six and two? No, that's eight. One. What? Why is it eight one? is one, once we throw away the sevens. Oh, I thought you were asking that. 6 plus 2. No, 6 plus 2 is 8, and 8 is equal to 1. So that's J. So, well, no, that just gives us a 1 uh, for that one. And so now that we've de determined that this month, this year, is a 1, oh. then I can ask you, what is, 30, uh, what is the 31st? And we can say... Okay, add one to it, that makes it 32. Subtract the next lower uh, uh, multiple of seven, which is 28, and that gives us a four, and a four is a... Thursday. Uh, Thursday, yes. <laughs> and that's gonna be next week, right? Yeah. Okay, so next week, Halloween is going to fall on our class, and I've been asked, what is everybody coming as? I don't know, we can discuss that, <laughs> okay. So next week is, is going to be uh, going to be Halloween. Um, what uh, now? Th that's for this. Uh, let's see. What was uh, what was the twelfth of this month? Friday. Okay, the twelfth. Now that we've got uh, we've got to add four, right? Okay, so we add uh, add four to twelve. We get 16, cast out 7s, we get uh, 2 remaining, so it was a Tuesday. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wait, I, th I got a 2 remaining, but doesn't that mean it's Friday and it's not like... Uh, just, uh, just a second, am I... I'm, I'm, I'm thinking things wrong. This, this, month, is actually a, this yeah. act month is actually a 1, isn't it? Yeah. This month is a 1. Next month uh, is what? What is the uh, number of next month going to be? The year is a two. Uh, next month is going to be a two. Add the two of them together. It's a four. So next month is a four. What day of the week is November fifth? Well, I'm confused. Like, what do you do with the four? Okay, um, we add it to whatever the date is of the month so in order to find the day, uh, find the day. So, so uh, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. You're right. You're right. The, uh, now, how did you, how did they get that? Okay. Do you want to explain it? Well, I get it now. Okay. <laughs> Everybody got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. How about um, <clears throat> the, the 14th of uh, November? Thursday. Very good. You got it. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, okay. Uh, the the thirtieth uh, of November. Oh, because I'm Oh, Saturday. You got it. Saturday. Oh my gosh. Excellent. Are you getting this? Okay. Keep so, a max Oh gosh. I see the easy. I have. Oh, I mean, okay. Uh, um, October. Okay, October 31st is a Thursday, and uh, like how I got November 30th was that uh, you add four weeks and then you add. Oh, good grief, you're not doing it That's with this method at all! Yeah, I know, I know, but I got. But he did it within method. one second. <laughs> he found the price of a priceless item. <laughs> Very good, very good. But this is the algorithm. Anyway, I, w I want to try something else here, and I'm not sure how easy it will be to do. Oh, is that what you did on, on the, um, uh, that you, it was like a link that you set up this last week, and you got to type the date in? No, that's right, that. that's right. Did you try that? Well, yeah, but I, I mean, like it just told you the that was kind of, but anyway, I'm confused a lot. Okay. Um, this, I, I couldn't look at an algorithm like that and not think about, okay, how would I get a computer to do this? 
<clears throat> and so I put this one, this little thing together. It's it's a, it's a very simple program, and it doesn't it doesn't handle the uh, leap years yet. But I mean that that's just a single line uh, of code. It just takes a little bit of fussing around to get all of the rules of leap years together. But it starts out by putting together a couple of uh, of little lists. One of them is a list of all of the uh, month numbers. Well, that's that's nice and straightforward. And uh, then we have a list of the days of the week, and uh, uh, the, the actual names of the day so that I can figure out by number what the actual names are. So that, that's straightforward. Then we have the months. Remember how we memorized the months? 6225035146246224. I just stuck those in a list here. We call it an array in uh, computing. And I've got an extra zero at the beginning because we don't want the zeroth member. We're only interested in the one through twelve for the months. We don't care about the zero. Turns out the zero is very useful down here when we're figuring out Sunday because it's Sunday is a zero and it starts with zero. So, so that works fine. So um, this is a, a JavaScript program which we can go ahead and run if you'd like, but it'll take me a minute or two to get it into a place where we can run it. How many people are really interested in? Uh, you showed us it last week. Yeah, you did. Yeah. I ran it for you last week? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, you might want to look through this and understand exactly what's going on in it. I'd be glad to explain that if anybody's interested in learning how to program in JavaScript. When you program in JavaScript, one of the nice things is you can take your programs and stick them out there for anybody in the world to run and say, here, this is, uh, this is how you solve this particular problem. I've heard that in my journey. Yeah, the JavaScript might be useful for that. It's actually, as a programming language, obnoxious in a lot of ways. So um, I don't know because I haven't. Used when it. it's when it's in web pages and doing something you don't want it to do, yes, I, I tend to agree with that. When it comes to learning how to program in a relatively modern language, it's really quite nice. It's it it has a lot of the same features that you would have in. Uh, in uh, C and Perl and PHP and so forth. It's pretty much the same syntax. And the syntax I've used here is very, very pedestrian syntax. I wanted to make it as clear as possible exactly what was going on and it explained it at each step all the way through. Um, in actuality, if one wanted to just get the calculation done, one could take this entire chunk of calculation and stick it all on one line and do it using a number of little shortcuts that would make it a little bit more uh, abstruse, but uh, but would reduce the number of keystrokes involved. I, I wanted to make it as, uh, as clear as possible here. And I will plague you with it no longer if nobody has any particular interest in... Well, can you put it in the link when you send out like the notes? Yeah, uh, it is in the link uh, for, okay. for the agenda, and okay. it will be in the link for the notes. Okay. Okay, let's figure out where we are. And, uh, I'm in a call with Elijah, but he's not answering. But he's what? He's not answering. He can. Oh, okay. Well, uh, that's fine. I, I was, as long as everybody out there can uh, see the screen, I assume yeah. Diane is yeah. not there right now. Yeah. But we'll just assume that not this is going to be properly recorded and. Uh, and viewable at a later date. Okay, so that's what we played with with math and uh, this in response to your request. I don't know the extent to which this satisfied your needs to experiment with interesting and useful mathematical things. It's not the kind of thing that I had in mind. That's interesting, but whenever I think about particularly interesting math, I think about beautiful math, which is usually in the form of graphing things. Hmm. Finding formulas that produce interesting shapes and the patterns when you graph them, which is something that in my math classes we never really did. Like they teach you how to graph things, but they don't really give you anything to graph. Hmm, okay. We could play around with that if you're interested. Uh, one thing that immediately comes to mind is can you put together a graph of a Christmas tree? Now, if you can do that, now what if we tried to make those limbs to the tree just a little bit more 
like that. Can you do that with a formula? Not devising exactly where the uh, uh, where everything is going to go by the data of its locations, its coordinates on the screen, but by uh, devising a formula which will create an expanding series of limbs going down the tree. It could, but for curves, I think I need to know calculus, which I don't. It's not calculus. For a curve, all you really need to uh, do is understand a uh, uh, exponentiation. Just just put in a square or something. That's true. That's yeah. a good point. Okay, Th think about that for a moment, and then uh, we we can talk about it later. Okay. I did take a geometry class, but that was more about. Uh, geometry is fun, but it's all conceptual, which I appreciated, but you don't get to do anything with math. Um, there's a lot of wonderful graphic stuff you can do. Okay, let's go on here. Um, here here's the, the link to the JavaScript program. Unfortunately, that JavaScript program would only work as a text file, not as an HTML file, because it had weird characters in it. And therefore, I wasn't able to put a link in there. I could put the link in, but you're going to have to cut and paste it instead of just clicking on it. Uh, but that's easily enough done. Okay, and we talked about the uh, Terry Eagleton lecture. Uh, I, I've listened to it twice already. I thought it was uh, r really uh, quite quite stunning. Just just because it's it's wonderful to listen to him speak. Uh, there is a good deal more uh, in our classroom if you're interested. And he goes on to a lot of other subjects, and particularly his his area is literary criticism, and. Uh, and he does a wonderful job of it. Now, this lady is a, a rather an odd case. She, she's a, a journalist, and but a very clever journalist. Uh, and uh, how many of you looked at antipodal eloquence? And what did you think of it? I thought it was interesting. Very well, all right. Yeah, she, she's yeah. clever. She just puts her words together nicely and interestingly yeah. and compellingly. I saw it too. Oh, okay. I was quite like, sure. You saw it too? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. I was quite sure. Okay. I, I just happened across it, and when I happened across it, I think the class will be interested in that. So I just threw it up there. Okay. Um, and specifically, I wanted you to be looking for rhetorical devices used in uh, in this speech that uh, have been presented. Uh, the, the most common, of course, I think, being lists or coordination. Uh, but you'll find others. You'll find use of metaphors. You'll find alliteration from time to time. And you may even find some of the other uh, antidiplosis and uh, various other aspects of uh, uh, of rhetoric, uh, which I'd like to look at at some point, but my contention there is that knowing the names of them isn't going to help us very much, except that it helps us in discussing them. Having the ideas in your head and the sounds of the words in your head is perhaps far more important. Okay, and we have the poems here. Uh, now these poems, uh, a couple of you listened to, uh, listened to them. Uh, this one is is a challenge, and I think I'll put it up there as a a long term challenge. Uh, oh, it looks as though that's actually no, it isn't playing. Okay, the chaos. Uh, let, let's just look at it so that you can understand what the problem here is. The question is: given English spelling and pronunciation. Uh, what kind of conclusions can we draw about what spelling produces what pronunciation? Uh, for example, the diphthong EA, is it E as in creature or is it EA as in creation? That's what this entire poem is about. It's a very cleverly uh, done poem. Uh, 
I will teach you in my verse sounds like corpse, core, horse, and worse. Now notice, why would O-R-S-E be pronounced horse, but O-R-S-E he here be pronounced worse? And uh, why is Susie pronounced as it is, but busy pronounced that way? And that's what the whole poem is, is uh, juxtapositions of contradictory uh, verbal interpretation of spellings. And uh, one of the problems with it, at least for Americans, is that it uses English pronunciation. And that has some more peculiar things, aspects to it than we have in, in America. Um, you, only two of you looked at this, right? Yeah. Am I listening to myself or is um, that no, Elijah? This is Elijah. Okay, Elijah. Uh, hi. I've been trying to figure it out for a long time. Just figured it out. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. you're talking about this poem? He's frozen. What is he trying to figure out? The, the, just how to get connected. Oh, okay. Glad you're connected now. Okay. This one is much simpler, but I'd like to look at it because we had two poems come in this week, and both of them need a little bit of understanding of how poetry scans. And I wanted to ask you the extent to which this is of real interest to you, because I would be glad to explore it further. Um, this poem or poetry in general? Poetry in general. Oh, yeah. Let, 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 let's do that. Here, for example, we, we have, we'll begin with a box, and the plural is boxes. But the plural of ox should be oxen, not oxes. Da, 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 You see what I mean? We want to recognize where that that uh, rhythm is and want to remain consistent with it. And that's the tricky part. I saw some of the uh, poems that came in which started with trimeter and then went on to hexameter and with everything else in between. And one of the things we're going to have to do is figure out how many feet are in a line. What is a foot, a metric foot? Well, there are a number of different kinds, and these are explained right there, right there. This is in our classroom, and uh, it's just a, a one-page uh, sheet that defines the metric uh, rhythms used in poetry. Uh, scansion is what this is called. How does the poem scan? And uh, I think it would make more sense for me to assign that as, uh, as part of the assignment for next week and then talk about it. But perhaps we can explore some poems this week and just see how they, how they fall into that. Okay, where are we here? Um, I, I'm going to wait on that one until the very end, I think. Elijah, can you see the screen? That's a good question. Um, I can't see anything. I just see your face as a... No, I mean, uh, did you get to the online classroom theater? Okay, All good. Right. Now, let us know if the screen is synced well enough with the voice that you can follow what's going on. That's what I'm concerned about. Okay. What did he say? Um, because the audio for you, you in that is delayed. It's it's synced with the screen share but it's delayed in terms of this is real time. And that's maybe one minute delayed from the actual class time. Oh, really? Those, yes. So this one is actually that much slower? Delayed, yeah, about one minute. A minute? It syncs, but it's a minute later than that. It's a minute later than real time. Yeah, the problem would be that if we had remote uh, students who wanted to participate, they couldn't do so, not if it's a minute late. That's rather strange. That's why it was so delayed uh, last time when they were when we were running both WizIQ and. Um, okay. Okay. Um, 
My yeah. mom was actually wondering, are you using the EIE internet or nearby one? This is uh, this is the EIE internet, and they have two okay. of them. We got the wrong one last time. Okay. Yeah, the, the first one, the proper one, didn't respond, so I ended up with the other one, and it wasn't good enough. But both of them are slow. So um, yeah, but the, the good one is good enough, I think, for our purposes. Uh, they've done everything they could to get a, a faster one, but we're just not in a good area here for that. Okay, we have a uh, debate. I just want to say it is pretty good. Good. Um, we have debate up here. Elijah has posted a number of debate topics, suggested debate topics. And uh, let's take a look at those and see what we think of them. I think this is it right here. No, that's our online classroom. There are a lot of tabs this time around. I, I, sh I should be closing tabs when we finish things. It would make things so much simpler. There's the try it editor. When you write something in JavaScript, by the way, make sure to try it out on, on these pages because if you make mistakes and you do it on your own system, it can just crash your web server. So let <laughs> use theirs instead. Okay. Um, Okay, here are the debate topics, and I made a few suggestions here. Um, I think we ought perhaps to add to these. And again, debate is one of the uh, uh, one of the very challenging things that we can do with language, because with a debate you can start out with something scripted, but when you start having to respond to your opponent, it goes off book, and we have to be able to improvise our speech at that point and ideally keep it in uh, in keeping consistent with the speech that has been pre-prepared and that's a challenge I think it would be delightful if we could put together some good debates on some reasonable subjects some of these are not particularly reasonable uh, let's let's just look, look, look at them well let's look at them down here where I have them now commentary. Vegan versus omnivore. Okay. Now there are a lot of uh, arguments on both sides of this, uh, but one of the big problems is are we, what are the advantages, uh, what kind of advantages are we looking for? Health advantages, economic advantages, ecological advantages, there are, there are a lot of uh, different aspects to be considered here. Um, so just think about that one. We, what would you say? Do you say? Say that again, Elijah. Husbandry is also husbandry is also part of that. Um. Animal husbandry. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. Yes. Okay. Uh, democracy versus communism. Of course, uh, democracy and communism are, are not contradictory. Although uh, communism in uh, it's real-world implementation, or at least things that have adopted that name, definitely are in contrast to democracy. Uh, I don't think this is a particularly good one, because we do want to, if, if possible, have something that can reasonably support, be supported by both sides. And so, uh, uh, communism and uh, capitalism are at least contradictory, but. Uh, that's also a very difficult argument to substantiate because uh, there aren't really any examples of real communism implemented anywhere. Okay. Uh, um, Democrat versus Republican. I suppose we could jump into that. Death penalty. And here, of course, I would want to expand upon that. Should the death penalty be imposed for anything? Are there good reasons to say, no, it never should? Does that appeal to anybody? No, it doesn't seem to appeal. Um, guns and arms, I said, needs more definition. Uh, the right to keep and bear arms, of course, is the way it's described in the... Uh, the whole guns and arms debate is very large these days. Mm -hmm. What so did he say? That's why I brought that up, because the there's whole... a lot of people saying we should take away guns and arms. Yeah. The whole debate is very large. It is. It's an immense so debate. 
we could define it more narrowly if we wanted to. We could uh, define it in terms, perhaps, of the. or just authorities and criminals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's um, true. Uh, and uh, the, the question is, of course, is this in keeping with the intent of the framers of the Constitution, uh, which is one of, one of the big questions. Uh, the right to keep and bear arms as defined in the Constitution had to do with the existence of a militia and uh, we don't really have militias in that same sense, and so it's, it's, it's perhaps a little difficult to justify, but indeed it, uh, it could lead to all kinds of interesting uh, discussion. Yeah. They banned um, guns and knives in Japan, mm -hmm. so people started killing each other with scissors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. So now they're working on banning scissors. Well, the Japanese are so good at weaponry, I can't imagine <laughs> they'd have to resort to scissors. <laughs> okay, interesting points. Um, existence of violent video games. Um, it looks like uh, maybe uh, guns, is, is that something that's of general interest? Which do you prefer? <laughs> I kind of like Call of Duty. Which is a violent video game. I see. <laughs> Those kind of correlate. Okay, I, don't, I, I can't participate there very well. I'm not very familiar with them, really. <laughs> uh, intelligent design. This is an interesting one. I only mention it as being interesting because it has been the subject of some very fascinating debates by uh, extremely capable debaters on both sides. Uh, the, the one, the big one that, that brings to mind when I hear that one is the movie Expelled. Yes, yeah, that that's uh, what's his name? I, for, I forget that. Ben Stein. Stein. Who? Ben Stein. Ben Stein. That's right, Ben Stein. And uh, and that that is an interesting one. Another person, however, Ben Stein is is uh, quite erudite and and uh, quite. Uh, okay. um, well educated, but the the person who really stands out there is David Berlinski, and I would like to recommend. I have a uh, there are a number of debates on uh, in our classroom by uh, uh, Berlinski. Some in some cases simply lectures by him about his books, the uh, the God delusion, uh, or, uh, what is it? Uh, that, that's the Dawkins book. His response was the devil's delusion, I think. And so the, the, you have some very, very good debaters. And it'd be interesting to see what they have said about it before launching into the subject ourselves, if that's of any interest at all. It doesn't look as though it is. Okay, that's fine. I think last week, I'm not sure, <coughs> but um, we were talking about Edward Snowden. Yeah. And NSA. Um, is that an idea that uh, that people would like to uh, entertain? Um, first of all, let's define it a little better. Oh, um, <laughs> the NSA and Edward Snowden and that kind of subject. If you can hear me. Oh, uh, well, that it wasn't really much of a definition. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I, I can't remember exactly what we said. It was on the phone. Okay. Um, the a question, the overall question might be the one of whistleblowers. Yeah, okay. That's and uh, how they should be treated and how the information that they have revealed should be examined and considered. One of the questions is, if this is indeed in violation of the law and in violation of uh, of uh, contracts that they have signed, uh, it, it may indeed be illegal. But then there's the question, if indeed they are revealing illegality, which is on a higher scale than that, uh, which than the transgressions that they have just 
uh, been responsible for in revealing it, whether that is deserving of scrutiny and consideration before uh, uh, accusing them of the, uh, the, the crime in this case of uh, perfidy. What is perfidy? Anybody know? Mm-hmm. Perfidy is a violation in a position of trust or violation of trust. Uh, perfidious is the uh, uh, the adjectival form of it, which would be perhaps appropriate in this particular case. Some people have called him a traitor. Well, one of the questions that arises there again is, if you are in a position in which you realize that you are breaking the law by doing what you have been ordered to do, what is the correct response to that. If in fact he feels that uh, what he was doing was breaking the law and perhaps doing that, that uh, that illegality was on a higher level perhaps than the one he feels would apply to uh, the agreements that he has signed. Okay, but uh, you see there are are a lot of issues involved in there and uh, it's very possible that it it might lead to some uh, serious debate. Does that Interest anyone? No. Well, okay. I don't. I honest. I don't know. Say that again. Again, I would be willing to take either side, depending on. Very good, Elijah. Very good, Elijah. Indeed, both sides could be uh, justified fairly well. Although it might not be something that we want to spend that amount of time researching. I, I don't know anything about it. My personally. Okay, the question, of course, that comes to mind is, is this something that we want to spend the time to learn? Sure, I'm up for it. Okay, Elijah's up for it. <laughs> uh, if it is, I will post material on, this, on the site that will uh, uh, elucidate the arguments on both sides, and we can uh, consider those. I, I'll, I'll post material out there and, and you folks look at it and say, okay, I want this side, I want that side, and then maybe we'll just switch over and do the opposite sides just to, uh, to practice. Okay, um, some other things up here are uh, interesting, uh, changing the driving age, the legal drinking age. Uh, uh, should presidents have to be born in America? Uh, I added odd things here, like well, perhaps pre- presidential candidates should demonstrate sentience before running for office. Yeah. <laughs> <I'll> take a <laughs> test. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be competent, but it means that uh, you will eliminate some, perhaps. Okay, so that that's just some thoughts there. Sword and sword, retain and written. Okay, let's. Uh, Jack. Jack. Any question? Is 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 Elijah yeah. saying something of note? Uh, so maybe note to his dog. <laughs> or are these just uh, nonsensical blurtings? Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, let's let's look at any of the projects that have been handed in uh, that uh, deserve comment or have elicited questions. <laughs> we we seem to have a, a, a fairly complex conversation going on out there. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at uh, uh, the papers that have been handed in. <laughs> yeah, we hear it. Okay, Xander has handed in a nice little fable here, and uh, when we look through it, um, uh, it's really nicely put together. Maybe we can uh, ask yeah, him to raise um, his hand or something. Do you, 
do you have um, any more questions as of right now? Yeah. Um, all right, so I'll. Can you just chat if if you want to speak? Yeah, do do, do the writing chat. That would be make more sense. Okay, right, this is nicely on, written, and I have no no problem with it. Um, um, Xander, do you understand uh, the cynicism error? And then I don't know what that means. Um, okay, it's there. something very few people understand, yeah. but it's something that we've encountered here specifically because it's on the SAT, and and, and the SAT gets it wrong. But the SAT regards synesis as an error. Oh, I took the PSAT this past weekend. How'd it go? It was yeah. terrible. Oh my gosh, it's so I didn't hard. think it was so that bad. Long. It's so no, hard. So it wasn't it's that so hard. hard. Yes. So, okay, so. <laughs> Maybe so. this is a good debate topic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's good. a matter of. Don't start. Don't it's just so hard. Um, yeah, I mean, it's okay, so towards, towards the yeah, end, I just started, to get, <laughs> I started to get really tired, you know? Yeah, so, and it was, I think they saved the easiest part for the end. It was, uh, it gave, they gave you a sentence, and this is like four, the four hour mark. And, it's like, oh. and so it said, find the error, and if there's no error, mm -hmm. choose the last E was the option. And I could not find an error for the life of me. I, I swear, I have, no, I don't swear. I could promise you that I had at least five errors in a row because I could not find them. I was so tired. You couldn't see any errors in them, and but E was always no error. Is that correct? Uh, a, B, C, D, E was always no error, right? Or E was the no error. E was the yeah. no error. And I could not find an error. Okay, I wish we could have those to look at so we could examine yeah, them and see what they are. Kind of but in, indeed, we, we've been... I, most of the time, I will be pointing out any errors in the sentences that we're looking at here that would be regarded as errors on the SAT. And there are certain kinds of things they look for. Oddly enough, the synesis error is one of them. Now, this may not be the case in more recent tests. I've got to go through more recent tests, see if they've still use, they're still using that. But the synesis error is simply a, uh, a conflict in number in an anaphoric reference. In this case, their belonging to them means plural. Uh, however, we're talking about one of you shows their face. It's a conflict. One of you is one person. Their is plural. It's used because one of you doesn't indicate gender. And we can't go on and say one of you has uh, showed, shown his place. No. Her place? No. Its place? No. Okay. And so we go into plural in order to avoid specifying. That's what the synesis okay. error is all about. You should have written one of you shows your face. Um, that would actually work. Okay. That would actually work. And there are a number of different ways in which the antecedent here can be singular. And we can figure out a way around the other half of it. One of them is see if we make the whole thing plural, then there's, there works. But the fact is, this is done consistently by the best writers and the best orators in the world. They break this rule because it's more awkward to do it the other way. And so I just pointed out, just so you know, that on the SAT, that's what they're looking for. Okay. That's... Did you, did you took the PSAT or the SAT? SAT. Oh, I took the PSAT. I took the PSAT. Okay. So we're talking about completely different things. Yeah. Well, I haven't taken the SAT yet. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, as you see, there's very little to uh, to criticize in here. I think I think it's very nicely done. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to suggest that you need to do something a little more challenging, a little more difficult, a little bit uh, perhaps more extensive. So, a clever fable, writing is solid and well-polished. Uh, it could be a little bit more formal in some places. And I'd talk about capitalization. Well, capitalization is appropriate if you're talking about a people. It's not appropriate if you're talking about a species, necessarily, unless the two are combined, like a Klingon, for example. Uh, so, any questions on this one at all? Um, I... Don't think so. What's it? 
diatribe. A diatribe. What is a diatribe? Anybody? You've all got your dictionaries handy, right? I don't see any dictionaries on the table. Oh, people are reaching under the table for them. Okay. Oh, there's this one. Okay. Um, yeah, a diatribe is a uh, a position paper. Usually, something particularly uh, something dissenting, something uh, pejorative, and uh, perhaps even uh, vituperative about something else. You're criticizing uh, a, a critique, but a, a perhaps a very excoriating critique. Yes. It's a forceful and bitter verbal attack against someone. Thank you. A forceful and bitter verbal attack against someone. Okay. So a diatribe might might be an appropriate thing to do. Look up screed and see uh, see what we have there. Okay. Let's go on to another one here. If you don't have any other questions, so that, that this was. Perhaps a, a good one to start with. Uh, nice effort. This is a poem, and it's about Disneyland, which uh, I think is rather delightful. Disneyland, of course, many people disparage Disneyland. Disparagement, I think, is another way to describe a diatribe. Okay. Uh, many people dis disparage Disneyland because it's so commercial, it's so polished, it's so... Uh, cookie cutter, if you'd like, but I, I must admit, when you look at Disneyland, and I threw in a little bit of a illustration there, one of the things yes. that distinguishes Disneyland so effectively from other commercial endeavors is it was originally uh, designed by an artist, mm -hmm. and the artistry has remained a major part of it, particularly in the architecture, but also in, in other aspects of it. So indeed, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And is, it's nicely put together here. The screed is a long speech or piece of writing, typically one regarded as tedious. Or the second meaning of, of a noun is a level layer of material applied to a floor or other surface. Oh, that's, that's a whole different uh, thing altogether. <laughs> and the verb is to level with hmm. a, a floor, a, straight, a layer of concrete with a straight edge using a back and forth motion while moving across the surface. Okay, so it's actually a verb as well. Yes. Very good, very good. Okay, now the, the problem here is uh, if you're going to write a, a poem with scansion and rhyme, we have to understand enough about what scansion is so that it sounds right. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a place where you will never be bored Da, 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 da. It's actually got four feet in that line. Now, what you're counting when you're counting feet is the emphasized syllables. Whether you have a few extra unstressed syllables or even some that are missing doesn't really matter. But the number of stressed syllables in the line is what you want. And four of them would make this tetrameter. And so I'm going to tell you about a place where you will never Board. We've got a few extra little syllables in there, not really uh, too terrible. A place you'll have fun in once you enter the doors. Well, sort of, but board and doors do not rhyme. And understanding what is and is not a rhyme is important, too. Let me give you the definition very quickly. A rhyme involves using the same sound at the end of a line from the last emphasized syllable to the end. So in other words, rhyming a non-emphasized syllable at the end doesn't count. You've got to rhyme the last emphasized syllable and everything that follows it. And so there were a number of those, those problems uh, I noticed in here. A place where you can get the sword in the stone, pull the sword from the stone sounded a little bit nicer because that's indeed what you're, what you're doing. Okay, and tension doesn't rhyme with mansion, and this is one of the examples I wanted to give. Shun rhymes with shun, but they're both unstressed syllables, so they don't count. You have to uh, uh, you you have to rhyme the last stressed syllable and everything that follows it. So uh, um, where where was it? Tension. I think I. I explained it in here somewhere. No, I guess I didn't. 
Okay. Anyway, we can we can discuss that at length further on. Uh, and and I'm very glad to see some poetry coming through. So, so please please continue. Okay, and Heather did one on seasons. Uh, and the, uh, it goes through all of the seasons are quite long and, and nicely put together. And, but then this line has five feet, this line has three feet. And then we, then here, interestingly, you switch to uh, a different rhyme scheme where we say, where are they going? Are they worried? Is it showing? Are they buried? And of course, buried doesn't really <laughs> rhyme with worried, but... Uh, In my head, I was saying it, and I'm going to the rhymes perfectly, because I couldn't think But, but yeah, you just have to have to play around with those a little bit. Nicely done, and I'm so glad, I, as I said, that uh, that people are playing with these because it's it's really a, a a part of the language that deserves more treatment than it's often given, I think. Uh, and yet, it also requires a lot of understanding of choosing the right word and finding how to use the right word. Uh, when you're writing a piece of poetry and you need to fit not just the meaning, but the scansion and the rhyme and get them all to work, there are a number of, uh, uh, there are so many factors there involved. And using a thesaurus is a good idea, using a, a, a rhyming dictionary is a good idea, and often you play around with a, con uh, with a, a combination of the two in order to find the right word. It's good practice. It's good practice. Nice couplet here. Flowers begin to bloom, giving color to the gloom. It fits and works nice. Okay. Okay, and here we have the dog tenor. And uh, this, this is nicely put together, but there was one specific problem that you had throughout. Did you understand my comments on that? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I yeah I also uh, have noticed that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The 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 rule is simply in English you want to avoid repetition. And if you find yourself using the same word or words multiple times, uh, probably the worst way to solve that. Well, you don't want to use them first of all. But the worst way to solve it is to find synonyms for them. The better way to solve it is to structure your sentence in such a way that it only appears once and yet applies in multiple cases. And that involves coordination or lists, usually. And uh, that is one of the rhetorical devices that is so effectively and consistently used in the uh, examples of oratory that we have in the classroom. OK, and the other, yeah, uh, again, I. I've put strokes through uh, places where the original was, for example, we still do not know why he barked at the boulder. Even Dingo didn't seem to know why he was barking. So, so I changed that to we still do not know why he did this, nor it seems did Dingo. You see, because the, the barking has been mentioned already a number of times up here, and we don't need to say it again. And so if we refer to that with a pronoun, that works fine. But then we can also, uh, nor this, uh, so, sorry, why he did this, nor, it seems, did Dingo. We don't have to say again, we don't know what, because we can just let that carry over and be used, uh, used again. Okay. And, of course, here... Um, we uh, th this is a clear case. You could actually make a, a case for uh, for doing it the way you did, but still, we, we're saying here. Eventually, we eventually came to the conclusion. This puts it in past tense. We came to the conclusion that Tanner had jumped. Now, when we came to the conclusion, we're talking about something that took place before that. So we're already in the past tense, and we put something further into the past tense. And the only way to make that clear is to put it into the past perfect. And that's what the uh, what you did here. When you put in the had jumped, he had jumped, that puts it further into the past. 
But once we say he had jumped, we have to realize that he also had swum. We can't say had swam. That's absolutely terrible. Do you, do you under, understand the problem there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this actually happened on another paper in uh, this week as well. And the question is there, do we need to look at verb forms and conjugation? Or do we all really understand that uh, uh, he had swum is right and he had swam is utterly dreadful? Um, does everyone understand the, the, the difference there in the problem? Okay, I'm not going to go into it unless unless it looks as though there's, there's a need to do so. What kind of dogs do you guys have? Um, I'm a Australian Shepherd usually. Oh my gosh, I have an Australian Shepherd too. Oh cool. Do you know Yeah. What? Is it usually? Yeah, usually. Yes. Yeah, we've had four dogs. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, so and two of them have been Australian Shepherds. So cool. Okay, yeah. this yeah, is Enza's. Mm -hmm. Your Enza? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, any questions at all on the uh, commentary on this one? Any uh, qu questions at all about the uh, the problems here? No, I, I understand. Okay, okay, yeah. good. Uh, also, on, on the last one there, uh, Dawson, I just, just wanted to uh, make clear what I set up here. Nicely related, if you promise to examine the contents below very carefully, you won't need to revise it. Uh, this is the thing. I, I, I find that in some cases there's a clear message that I want understood here, and asking you to revise it is the one way that I know for certain that you're going to understand what the problems were. But I don't want to add to anybody's busy work for the week uh, by giving you things that don't need to be done. So if you actually look at it closely enough and understand, then the revision is really not necessary. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And I'll, I'll probably use that device in the future, though in some cases we may want to have a polished version of it uh, in order to put it into some sort of compilation that may be in some sense or another published, and so then we want to do the revision. Okay. Um, this one, again, very, very nicely okay. uh, done. Um, it, it's so utterly dismal. Yes, I know. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me, my, my daughter wrote a, a novel when she was 14. A novel? Yes, and uh -huh. beautifully written all the way through, but almost exactly the same subject matter. Uh, and it uh, and, and so, you know, the protagonist ends up deliberately contracting in, uh, a, a disease and dying in a Turkish prison. I, I don't know where Kids your age come up with these things. <laughs> anyway, uh, nicely put together. Did anybody look at this thing? I did. Yes. What was it? Oh, it's just strange. <laughs> it, it it just looked like the same thing you were talking about. You've got a screen yeah. with somebody speaking on it and. Yeah. Uh, do you know what that? Uh, uh, this, this, do you know which one it was? I think I may have shown it to you before. It's in the classroom. I didn't see it. It's the Apple commercial where the uh, Macintosh was coming out, and it was being released in 1984. And of course, the uh, the reference was to George Orwell, and you know what George Orwell's 1984 is all about, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's it's a uh, it's a novel about a futuristic dystopia. A dreadful uh, um, environment existing in the future, and this is one in which every citizen is surveilled through every inch of their existence, and uh, all are expected to do exactly as they're told, and so forth. That's pretty much the the standard dystopic uh, uh, mm -hmm. definition. But in this case, we see these very gray and uh, uh, and subservient. Uh, servile uh, characters marching into this room and there's a screen at the front that is uh, on, on which you have Big Brother speaking to them and telling them what they are to be doing and so forth. Very, very much 
like some of the uh, oratory that took place during the, uh, uh, during the Nazi regime. And one character coming in in color and throwing this hammer up and smashing the screen and the, 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 you get the wind coming, coming through. And of course, this was all about IBM ruling the world of computers and how it wouldn't be the same after the Macintosh came out. <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's an amazing commercial. You should look at it. Anyway, it was so, so much like what you're talking yeah. about. Okay. Uh, any questions at all about any of the uh, comments here? No, that I can think of. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it was nicely to put together. Okay, and here's Elijah. <laughs> Do you have any? Okay, um, now Elijah went and fixed that. He, he has he has repaired it and done a, a, a further version without actually being asked. I gave him one project credit for it. I just could not understand how to get Lila wrong after we had just done the play sheet. <laughs> So I apologize for, uh, for putting that up there, Elijah. Uh, anyway, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, it's nicely told, and it does bring the story to a, a conclusion and, uh, and really rounds the story off nicely, except when Annie was laying peacefully. <laughs> because Annie is not so vigorous. What does oviparous mean? Um, boring. Egg laying. Boring. So yes. <laughs> kind of safe thing. Yes, we can. Do you have any questions or? Any questions, um, um, Elijah? Um, I think he's on your thing now. Oh, okay. I'm afraid I'm not understanding what he's doing. Um, he's the he's he just went over your um, your story with okay. the comments and stuff. So if if you have any questions, nicely done, nicely rounded, nicely concluded. Okay, let's look at the next one here. Uh, all right. This is Diana's work, and Diana is talking about it, a trip to uh, Albi, which I gather, it, well, it's in France, I'm not exactly sure where, but uh, the specific problem I see in, uh, in Diana's work is the absence of articles, which is not com a common error for Native, Ameri Native English speakers. And so I, I don't know whether this implies that uh, Diana's first language may not be English. I'm not sure. But in any case, the rule in English is that all singular nouns must have an article, except for, and we've got a long list of exceptions. And I gave, I did pass that out earlier. Uh, the, you, there are certain things we just don't use articles for and certain things we do, but many articles were missing in this one. Uh, uh, when you go to a museum, for example, you just don't go to a museum. You go to a museum or the museum. And uh, this, is, uh, this is something to, for which there are certain exceptions. You, you, don't go to, you can go to school. In England, you can go to hospital. We don't use an article there, but we do in America. We go to the hospital. And so there are certain exceptions to the need for that uh, article. But we would certainly need it to indicate a, 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 a museum. Yes, Heather, you had a question. Well, there's one in Oh, good grief. We're, we're running over already. Um, OK. For, I have an, a question. Uh, after on the, for the top paragraph, yeah, um, there are just a few tourist attractions in Albi. Wouldn't you say the Toulouse something, the TL Museum, <laughs> comma, instead of just TL Museum, comma? Wouldn't you say the oh, TL that, Museum? That's a good point. 
Oh, I'm trying to. Oh, right up here. Because because you say it on the second in the second paragraph. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right I'll there. Be. Yes, yes. That, that should have an article too. Thank you. Yeah, that de deserves to have one as well. I'm sorry, I missed that. What would you after the comma? Would you say the cathedral Saint Cecile also? Um, yes, actually, I think that would make a lot more sense. I'm I'm sorry, I I, uh, I should have put that in the way you're describing it. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, so this is the home of Toulouse the track. Uh, Henri Lautrec began studying at Fanman Common. Okay. Um, a very young horse, comma, gazelle, comma, was painted. We have to have commas around in a positive. Okay, I am so sorry. You're absolutely right. We are running over, but we tend to do that. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Let's see. That we, uh, debates. We're, we're back here onto the uh, onto our agenda. Yes. Um, I was wondering. Last week, uh, you said something about a a Tolkien poem. I guess. That Absolutely. The cat and the fiddle. And That's right. And that was um, one that Elijah was going to recite. Oh, can you post the link um, on the his... notes? Because I really want to read it. I, I bet you oh, absolutely. We, we should do that. Can I remember it? I don't think so. I used to I know can... it by heart. Oh, no, that's right. Oh, there I was an inn, a merry old inn, beneath an old gray here, hill. And there they brewed a beer so brown, the man in the moon himself came down one night to drink his bell. Uh, the ostler had a tipsy cat that played on a five-string fiddle. And up and down he ran his bow, now squeaking high, now purring low, now sawing in the middle. They also had a little dog who's mighty fond of jokes. When there's good cheer among the guests, he cocks his ear at all the jests and laughs until he chokes. They also keep a horned cow as proud as any queen. And But laughter makes a tufted tail and makes a something on the something and dance upon the green. I'm sorry, I'm lost it anyway. It's uh, you've you've all got a copy yeah. of Tolkien. It's in the in the chapter, I believe, the the, the sign of prancing pony. Really? Yeah. Oh just... Yeah. And it's been set to music a few times. So. Um, do you want to have Elijah recite the thing? Um would Elijah would like to recite it? Would he like to sing it? Is it's a toy. Yeah, give me a moment. Come on. Which one? I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Are, are you going to sing it? <laughs> So the cat on his fiddle played and the 
Nicely done, Elijah. Nicely done. We, yes. That was yes. just fine. What we need is, is is better sound reproduction next time. If we can get a bigger speaker, that would work. Okay. Um, sorry to run you folks over. Um, what have we decided exactly that we need to do for next week? One of the big questions I asked earlier was of these assignments. Uh, let me know which of these you would like more of. I like the poems. Those are cool. The poems. The, the one from Lewis Carroll. Sure. Okay. Let's look at some more Lewis Carroll poems, if you like. He wrote a number of very clever poems. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look at the, the very uh, last one in uh, uh, Through the Looking Glass. Uh, that one is uh, an astounding poem and a, a beautiful one. Uh, it, it's at the very end. And... Uh, Perhaps we even want to look at the walrus and the carpenter. Okay. And th these are so beautifully done. And he had an interesting device that uh, made his poems unique in the sense that if you use that same device, immediately people will say, that just sounds like Lewis Carroll. <laughs> and what really what uh, the device was uh, iambic heptameter in tercets. In other words, three lines rhyming together, not just two, but three lines rhyming together in with seven foot lines uh, in the I, I am's. And so, uh, uh, how was it beginning? The, the sun was shining on the sea, shining with all its might. It did its very best to make the billows smooth and bright which was odd because it was the middle of the night. You always get this third line, which you're not expecting after the first couplet. So let's look at that one a little bit and see what we can do. Okay, um, any other specific directions we should go? We didn't even t talk about uh, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> Have you all listened to those? Yes. yes. Okay, the question is, should we talk about them? I don't know. Well, let's let's write some more poetry for next week. We'll talk about poetry. We'll look at Lewis Carroll's poetry and perhaps some others. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to bring up? Go ahead and post it, and we'll address it and see what we can do with it. And if we're lucky, this will be properly recorded together with the screenshot. Okay, folks. Thank you. <laughs> Elijah says thanks. All right, and finally, Jeff. Okay, it's interesting how that how that appears backwards. I'm going to end the broadcast.